What I'd like to do tonight is just take a few minutes, and before we begin uh, Philippians and Colossians, and if we don't finish Colossians, we'll, I think, work that in next week, and give you an overview, uh, just the, uh, the main facts about the book of Ephesians, one of the most important books in the entire Bible. And Rick wasn't able to uh, write, understand and to get to that last uh, week. You probably don't have your notes, and so but at any rate, I'd just like to go through, uh, as I say, give you a bottom line um, overview of the book of Ephesians, um, six chapters, and um, if you don't have the outline, just listen as I go through them, and go home, and hopefully you do have the notes at your house. The church is likened to a body, that's chapter one. It's likened to a temple, that's chapter two. Likened to a mystery, chapter three. A new creation, chapter four. is likened to a bride, my favorite, chapter five, uh, comparing uh, Christ's love for the church, and like a soldier, chapter 6. Now, some unique features. The book of Ephesians has more about the doctrine of election and predestination than any other book for its size. I've just finished uh, uh, an overview of my doctrine of salvation that we will begin. I have 100 pages, and uh, uh, we will begin this in January. We've the Old Testament last year, the New Testament this year. And uh, in January, Systematic Theology will begin with what the Bible says about salvation. And we'll look at the great words in the Bible, justification, sanctification, glorification, and predestination and election. And so I'm, I think I'm, uh, I'm thoroughly mixed up on that, but done a lot of work on it. And so certainly the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians will tie into later on next year, uh, if the world doesn't end on December 21st, uh, as we talk about what God says, uh, uh, do you have, does everyone have a chance to be saved, etc.? We'll go into that. And, and also uh, a very important study, and I've just finished that now, 25 pages, um, uh, salvation in the Mormon faith. And it was one of the most amazing things you've ever heard, and we'll be discussing that, uh, what salvation means to um, hopefully our new president, but we don't know. All right, and so, but uh, the doctrine of predestination election is uh, paramount in the book of Ephesians. And then um, it offers the key reason for our salvation. Why did God save you? Why did God send his son to die? And in Ephesians 2, verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the glorious What's the word I want? The, the, uh, I'm having a, a moment here. Um, the, uh, other, we will be trophies of God's grace and in heaven for the angels uh, to marvel over and forever and ever and ever. One of the reasons is to show us off, to display his grace in our lives in heaven forever and ever and ever. And that's Ephesians 2 verse 7. And uh, it tells us both of our salvation and service for God have been foreordained. We all uh, can quote probably Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself it is the gift of God, not of works, that sin man should boast. But Ephesians 2, 10 is equally important, and that sort of completes the first two verses. It says that because of that we have been foreordained for good works before the foundation of the world. So me teaching this in the will of God tonight has been foreordained before the foundation of the world. And the good works that God desires for you to do uh, have been also foreordained. So when you quote 2 and 9, why uh, make sure you put verse 10 also. And Ephesians records the second of two occasions where Paul employs the Greek word poema from what we get our English word poem. Now there are two great poems in the New Testament. And one is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, and uh, it has, it, there it's translated workmanship. And God is saying here that, then Paul is saying that the, that the, uh, the nations uh, have no excuse because the people that have never heard, and that's one of the, and we'll talk about that next uh, year also. What about little babies that die? And what about those who supposedly have never heard the gospel? Uh, what will happen to them? Well, one of the things is part, part answer. Paul says that uh, they know the things that are made. Nature, the poema, God's nature, and that's God's work, creation. And then the other it's, uh, time it's used in Ephesians 2, 10, where it's re rendered workmanship referring to the divine work of redemption. And so here's the bottom line. God has two glorious poems, that of creation and that of redemption. So we are, we are poems here. 
And poems are supposed to rhyme, and sometimes uh, we, uh, we don't rhyme them as they should be rhymed. I think of the one I uh, heard years ago, uh, pound and hit the ketchup bottle, none comes out, then a lottle. And so, well, that's probably not, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's not, that's not rhyming, but we are God's poem, creation and redemption. All right, see what you're learning tonight about ketchup. And... Um, and Ephesians provides for us the most concise purpose for spiritual gifts. We briefly touched on spiritual gifts. Spiritual gift is a supernatural ability uh, given by the Lord Jesus to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit then gives these gifts as he desires to you and to me, all people who accept Christ. And I think every believer has one or two gifts. No believer has all the gifts. But Ephesians tells us the the key reason for the gifts, twofold. Number one, that through this gift that I have and that you have, whatever that might be, we might use our gift to edify the body of Christ and to glorify the Christ of the body. Ephesians tells us this twofold. And then uh, uh, Paul's self-description of being an ambassador in bonds is found only uh, in the entire Bible in Ephesians 6 verse 20. We all know the tragic uh, murder, little savages, of our ambassador to Libya. And, uh, well, uh, if uh, things get any worse here in America, it well may mean that some ambassadors here tonight might wind up in bonds. Of course, I don't think the world will care much about it. Uh, probably the politicians will say, well, it's just a bump in the road. And uh, I, just, I can't believe what, what's going on now. So, uh, but years ago when... Um, uh, Francis Schaeffer came here. He said, uh, many of you know who he, uh, he came here on three occasions. He said, the trouble with uh, Christians in America today is that nobody's trying to kill us. And I think that's true. Ambassador in bonds, the Apostle Paul. All right. And then um, Paul's self-description of being, let's see, the shortest definition of a Christian is simply one who is in Christ, a phrase found no less than 35 times in Ephesians, more than any other biblical book. A believer, a Christian is one who is in Christ, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And as D. James Kennedy would uh, have us uh, to know, he's in heaven now, that uh, if uh, Simon Peter or something would say, or God would say, why should I allow you into my heaven? Well, uh, dear Father, not to be disrespectful, but I have as much right to be in your heaven as your son has because I am in Christ. Okay, and Paul talks about that. And um, the person and work of the Holy Spirit is mentioned no less than 13 times in Ephesians. The church had more famous preachers than did any other church. This would include men like Paul, Apollos, John, and Timothy. Uh, they had uh, some glorious uh, uh, heritage there. Ephesians is the Joshua book in the New Testament. It has been called Paul's third heaven epistle. And I don't know where I got these words from, but they're beautiful. It has been referred to as the Alps of the New Testament and the Mount Whitney of the High Sierras of all Scripture the book of Ephesians. Um, Christ is in no other epistle is our pre-conversion position in this world and post-conversion in Christ so vividly described as in this book. Our pre-conversion position, our post-conversion position. And maybe we'll talk about that in a minute maybe. Uh, Ephesians provides the most beautiful New Testament passage describing Christ's relationship uh, to and love for his church. Now, the church is described as a mystery and as a building, etc., and as a temple. But uh, the, when God got ready uh, to uh, inspire Paul to write about the love that Christ had for his church, uh, he did not say, and I would have understood it, uh, fathers, love your sons as Christ loved the church. Uh, son, our, our wife, my wife and I have only the one child man. Or, certainly I would understand this, grandfathers, Love your grandchildren as Christ loved the church. He didn't do that. He chose the most personal, intimate relationship possible in human history. Husbands, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So a man ought to love his wife and, if need be, lay down his life for her as Christ loved the church in the book of Ephesians. And the Ephesians is the Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, is the only New Testament church to receive a letter from more than one Bible writer. 
Um, Paul, of course, wrote the, the book of Ephesians. But in the book of Revelation chapter 2, another apostle by the name of John the Apostle, he's on the Isle of Patmos, and he writes uh, to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. So it's the only church to receive inspired letters from two apostles, the apostle Paul and the apostle John. Uh, I think that's it. Let's see if there's anything else. I don't think I want to. Uh, well, probably, yes. Let me just. Uh, okay. The church is likened to a temple. This is on page 21, if you're keeping notes here. In whom all, Paul said, in whom all the building fit together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. And uh, here Paul talks about our pre conversion. Think of that time when you accepted Christ. Five minutes before that, here is a description. We're dead in sin, influenced by Satan, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We are controlled by lust, separated from Christ, excluded from the promises, hopeless in this world, without a hope. Well, that's uh, what we once were. Now, what God did, uh, he loved us and he liberated us. Why get, God did it? Ephesians 2, verse 10, and here's the verse I was trying to quote a while ago, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And so I would imagine as uh, Jesus would uh, give the 85 cent tour and, and uh, to the angels, etc., and the seraphims and the cherubims and the living creatures and uh, whatever else is in heaven there, uh, and there's Harold Wilmington, and, and uh, there's um, uh, Mary Smith, and Bob Jones, and whatever. Uh, probably uh, they're trophies of our grace, of my grace. Probably we would break into song, not have I gotten but what I received. Grace has bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, cried I abase. Hey, folks, we're only sinners saved by grace. Saved by, this is my story, to God be the glory. We're only sinners saved by grace trophies of the grace of God. And how God did it, he did it by the grace of God, by the blood of Christ. What we are now, we are products of God's workmanship. We are partners with Israel in God's son. We are part of God's temple. Where we were before he saved us, what we are now. All right, now let's see one final on page 29 here. Uh, the last chapter talks about soldiers and fighting. And... Um, on page 29 in the middle, uh, letter B, uh, front line fighting. And here, this, uh, the Christian is not involved in a playground, but a battleground. And there's a battle going on. And uh, our enemy is the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Sometimes we uh, put a period there and we said, okay, we're not going to. But that's a comma. But against, we do wrestle principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our enemy, his cohorts, now his cunning, the wiles of the devil, his cruel tactics, the fiery darts, and um, our endeavors, the game plan we are to obey, we are to stand, we are to pray, we are to worship, we are to preserve, uh, pres uh, persevere. Uh, our equipment, the armor of God, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And I have uh, quoted from, I think, Dr. Wearsby and several others on page 30 and 31. Each piece of the armament here, apparently when Paul, of course, he wrote uh, uh, Ephesians and, and uh, he was uh, chained to a guard. Uh, some suggest every six hours he had his own hired house. He wasn't in a prison. The second in prison he was, but the first one. But he was still chained by... The, the Praetorian Guard, and uh, every six hours they would change. Uh, they probably come in their, uh, you know, uh, workday clothes, and then they would change officially into the armor, because officially now, like uh, in London there, you know, the people that guard the, the uh, uh, Buckingham uh, Palace there. And uh, anyway, he watched them as they put on the various pieces of, of uh, equipment. And apparently then he was um, inspired by the Holy Spirit to make a spiritual application, for example, to uh, the girdle, uh, the breastplate, the sandals, the shield of faith, or the shield, the helmet, and the sword. And uh, that is our equipment. And we're to put on the whole armor of God. And I thought of uh, Martin Luther's great song, the, the third stanza here, 
uh, in fighting this good fight where he says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we shall not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for ho lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. All right, uh, so much for Ephesians. And uh, now moving on to Philippians and see how far we get with Philippians and Colossians. Hopefully you do have the notes of Philippians here. Uh, Philippians at a glance, can it be? Can it be, is it possible to offer a praise in a prison and to write of joy from a jailhouse? And I had these words. Uh, what about singing in the slammer? <laughs> well, that's exactly what's, you have to know the uh, North Carolinian translation to get that out of the text here. But uh, the word joy, interestingly enough, appears more times in the book of uh, Philippians than only four chapters than any other book and the entire Bible for its size. Joy uh, in jail. Uh, praises in prison. All right, and uh, there are four chapters, and each chapter I have uh, designated this way. Chapter 1, Christ is the believer's purpose in this life. Secondly, Christ is the believer's pattern. Thirdly, Christ is the believer's prize. And fourth, Christ is the believer's power. He is our purpose, our pattern, our prize, and our power. Okay, unique features on page two. By the way, the top of page here, some of the individuals and the characters, and some are real characters, that appear in the book of uh, Philippians. And there were two ladies that are fussing with each other, Yodia and Syneche. And uh, J. Vernon McGee uh, said, uh, yeah, they, these, uh, these, uh, these old girls were, you know, having a hand fight. Well, I'm not sure that they were good, good women. And Paul loved them both, and they loved God, but they just couldn't get along. And he said, now, friends, he said, I, I brought him here several times, uh, Dr. Uh, J. Vernon McGee. He said, we'll talk, we're going to talk about odious and soon touchy tonight. And so, uh, well, some, believe it or not, sometimes uh, men uh, fuss with each other, too, but but, uh, but this shows that, uh, you know, I used to think these church members were, and the pastors back then were, uh, they, they were just not like us. You know, they didn't have ring around the collar and et cetera, and headaches and arms that swelled up. And, and uh, they uh, probably uh, drank communion juice uh, in the Sunday school room and, you know, and played with, uh, I don't know, Bibles instead of toys. But they, uh, Paul, or uh, James says, uh, talking about Elijah, these were men and women of like passions. And there's nothing new in the sun. And we're all made in the same mold. Now, some of them like Elmer and I and Charlie were, were older, were moldier than the others, I guess. But whatever, you're driving up a wall right now. Um, millions of Christians had that same problem. So these two, and apparently there was this godly man in the church of Philippi, Paul simply called his true yoke fellow. And uh, he said, please get these uh, ladies together. And I'm sure he did, and probably uh, there could have been a revival in that church. Uh, I think the, the church in Philippi was Paul's favorite church. All right, uh, unique features. This epistle is addressed to the first church that Paul founded in Europe. Talk about that pretty soon. It seems to have been his favorite church. It may have had more Gentiles in its membership than any other church founded by Paul. It was probably the last written of Paul's four prison epistles. Okay, like Romans, Philippians had more than one closing as if Paul was reluctant to end his letter. There's three or four uh, different endings. Sometimes uh, my wife will be talking to her niece there, and her, uh, her sister's dying in, uh, down in uh, North Carolina, and a uh, rest home down there, and so she's talking to her daughter. Oh, how's, uh, how's your mom today, etc. Yeah, okay, well, we'll see you later. And then they keep talking because Debbie st still wants, she's got some heartaches. And so maybe 10 minutes later after several, all right, well, so this is it. And then I think, well, okay, they, they finally close the conversation. Paul, uh, it's just like they didn't, they just reluctant to hang up the phone. And this is the way Paul felt, for example, uh, in Philippians 3, verse 1, he's just halfway through now. And he says, finally, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, well, then he goes on. Uh, chapter 4, he said, uh, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, think on these things. 
and that's chapter 4, verse 3. And he goes on verse of chapter 4, verse 20. He says, Now unto God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And finally, in chapter 4, verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He just did, he was reluctant to put down his pen and probably, probably apparently, Paul, uh, God said, okay, put it down. That's it. That's it. Uh, so much for, for this letter here. And uh, uh, Philippians is probably my, Paul's most, uh, uh, the most personal of Paul's letter to the churches with more than 100 first pronoun, uh, pr- personal pronouns in, the four, in his four chapters. Number seven, Paul received more financial support from this church than from any other. Probably one of the most uh, destitute, uh, as far as poverty is concerned, churches uh, that he founded, and yet they gave him more. And the, first of all, they gave him their hearts and their wills, and then they gave him of their wallet. All right, uh, number nine, the epistle answers the question regarding Christ, uh, God's attitude of those who preach Christ with sincere notions. And I have a a news report I want to talk to you about in a minute now. What about those preachers who preach uh, gospel, the book, the blood, and the blessed hope for many years, and then they're found terrible sin? I'll give you an illustration. This came out uh, in news uh, the other day. Uh, What about how does God uh, look upon those people? Okay, now they're immoral, uh, and yet uh, uh, their message is okay. The messenger isn't. Uh, And Paul talks about this here. We'll see it in a minute. All right, number 10. It gives us the first of two predictions that someday all creatures, both saved and unsaved, will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord of all. Number 11. It also provides the first of two passages which assure us that our new bodies will be fashioned like Christ's glorified body. What about the new you? Well, Paul says, and later on John says the same thing, that, that uh, God will fashion us like Christ's glorious body. And John says that as he is, we will, shall be also. And so here's, here's the situation. We will have bodies like the glorified body that Jesus had after his resurrection. And uh, so to study that body will tell us what the condition of our body. First of all, it was a recognizable body. They didn't recognize him at first, uh, not because he was that different, but because they weren't expecting him, a recognizable body. And secondly, he was a body not conditioned by time or gravity. He could pass through a solid wall. Thirdly, it was, in this glorified body, it was a body, a literal physical body of flesh and bone. Remember, he, they thought he was a ghost that Sunday night he passed and he, uh, after his crucifixion, the first Easter Sunday. He said, gentlemen, he said, uh, it's not a spirit. He said, touch me, handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as I have. And yes, in this body he ate some wine or drank some wine, grape juice, whatever, and a fig bar and uh, uh, Stan, the thing, Stan keeps me in fig bars, uh, and uh, uh, boiled fish, I don't like the fish. And so will we have pizza in heaven? Well, I don't care for that much, but uh, yes. So we'll have a body like he had, the glorified body. All right, and um, in number 11, it also provides the first of two passages which assure us, well, I'm sorry, number 14, I'm skipping over a few. The church at Philippi was founded as a result of a supernatural vision experienced by Paul while at Troas during his second missionary trip. Now, it's interesting, um, his first missionary trip, and this has helped me much, and maybe it'll help some of you now, and you're trying to struggle to find the will of God. Uh, Paul knew exactly where he was going and why he was going there, and what he would do when he got there. That's the first missionary trip. And he was gone for probably two years, and he came back and gave a report to the sending church, uh, the church at Antioch of Sidia. And then he started out on the second missionary trip. And this time, of course, there was a squabble between Paul and, and Barnabas. And so Barnabas took his nephew, Mark, and they went to Cyprus and and uh, they started the new work there. And Paul chose Silas. And so uh, they leave uh, from the east coast there, and they're headed west. And Paul said, I'll tell you what, let's do. Um, our plans are not that uh, laid out uh, right now. But let's go north and check on some of the churches that uh, Barnabas and I started. And the Holy Spirit said, don't go north. Okay. 
All right, uh, let's go south. We haven't been there. The Holy Spirit said, don't go south. Wow. So they just came from the east. And uh, the Holy Spirit said, don't go north and don't go south. There's only three directions left, up, down, and west. And so at Troas, Paul received what H.G. Wells, a historian and um, uh, an atheist, who wrote at Columbia University many years ago and wrote a, a volume, uh, uh, Outline of History, that for I don't know how many years, every student at Princeton and Harvard and all the, the major schools, universities had to read the Outline of History. But he said that he didn't, uh, he didn't believe uh, in the Bible at all. But this was the most important, probably is a, you know, a hallucination or something. He had too much uh, uh, pizza before he went to bed. But, but uh, whatever this, this vision was, it was the most important in church history. Because it had not been for this vision at Macedonia, then at Troas, rather, uh, he said, then uh, Europe uh, would uh, be in abject slavery, and uh, the Western world would not have evolved as it did. So he did give Paul for that. It was a nightmare, but it was a very uh, convenient nightmare. But he saw, he saw this, this uh, vision of a man dressed in, in a Greek garb, and the man says, come over to Macedonia, for we need you. And then Luke says, and apparently at this time Luke joins the team, and Luke said, then we, in, we felt then that we felt assured this is what God would have us to do. So if you're struggling, and you know, everybody knows what God wants them to do, I'm not quite sure. Well, uh, you're in good company. Paul wasn't either. But uh, he did something very important. He cooled his heels. He did not jump until God told him where to go. So they go, and he goes to Philippi, and of course, famous chapter in chapter 16, uh, his first three converts, he had an Asian uh, business uh, woman named Lydia, and then a Greek a soothsayer, a, a demon-possessed girl, and then a Roman jailer, and uh, I have the bottom of the page here, these three converts representing three nation, nationality, Jew, Greek, and Roman. Now, I'm studying this predestination. Does God save only a group of people, and he's not interested in saving all? I mean, uh, should we really change the words to Jesus loves the little children? Does Jesus loves some of the little children, <laughs> some of the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, and some of them are precious in his sight. Well, here all three groups are mentioned, a Jew, a Greek, and a Roman. And not only that, but I thought about, uh, don't have this in my notes, but uh, in the book of Acts, you have three great conversions uh, Romans are in Acts 8, Acts 9, and Acts 10. And uh, you have uh, representatives in those three chapters of the three sons of Noah. Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, uh, Ham was a cursed race. Well, let's just think about this now. The first major conversion in the book of Acts uh, in Acts chapter 8 was uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, a descendant of Ham. That's chapter 8. And then in chapter 9, you have uh, a descendant from Shem, Saul of Tarsus. And in Acts chapter 10, you have a descendant from Japheth, Cornelius. And so, no, God loves the whole world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ Jesus tasted death for every man. Okay, all right, and uh, the last, um, number 17. Thus this church, Philippi, conceived in a vision, would reach its apex in a prison where Paul would uh, write to the church. Strange and wonderful indeed are the ways of God. Next page, uh, 19. It also describes the book of uh, Philippians, the second of two kinds of peace in the Bible. Paul talks about the first in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, in being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Every believer here, you may be as backslidden as Job's turkey, but if you're saved... If you're saved, you have the peace with God in that there's no war going on between God and yourself. But there's another peace that all, not all Christians have. That's the peace of God. And Paul talks about that in Philippians 4, verse 7. 
He said, uh, be anxious for nothing but everything, prayer and supplication. Let your requests be, known, be uh, known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. And how many times in my life have I had, uh, obviously, the, the peace with God for over 50 years? But, oh, my, I couldn't count the times where I did not have the peace of God uh, because that comes only uh, when we give him our all. When we sing, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, and I am the clay. So he mentions that, the peace with God in Romans 5, the peace of God that passes all understanding, the peace that the world cannot give nor take from in the book of Philippians chapter 4. All right, and then uh, number 21. Philippians contains the greatest theological passage on the person of Christ in all the Bible. In fact, Lewis Perry Schaefer, the founder of Dallas Seminary, uh, when uh, they would read, uh, he died before I, I got there, but uh, students told me that uh, they would have a Bible reading, and when he came to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, he'd have everyone in the class stand and just meditate for a couple of minutes before they read it. And uh, he said, these words are worthy to be written in gold. And we're going to read them pretty soon. The greatest theological passage in all the Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. It's referred to in the Greek as the kenosis passage. We'll talk about the kenosis in a moment here. All right. Uh, 23. Uh, the passage ends with the promise by someday all creation will bow in submission and acknowledge that Jesus is indeed supreme Lord of all. Okay, now uh, just a note on uh, at the bottom of the page three, comparison with other Bible books, Second Timothy. Philippians was Paul's last epistle during his first Roman imprisonment. Second Timothy was Paul's last epistle during his final Roman imprisonment. Let me briefly tell you about the, uh, the last seven epistles that Paul wrote. He wrote four of them during his first imprisonment. He had two of them. He wrote uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon during his first imprisonment. Then he's released. Now, in Acts 28, he's still in jail, but he's released right after that. And then between his release and his second imprisonment, he writes 1 Timothy and Titus. Then he's rearrested at, Tide, at, at uh, Troas, interesting, the same place where he saw the Macedonian vision. And this time, being a Christian was a felony, and it uh, involved the, the death penalty. And so then he was, uh, in, uh, again, put in a Roman prison this time, not his own hired house, but a dungeon. And there he writes 2 Timothy. So the first imprisonment, four books. Uh, between the imprisonments, he writes two, that's six, and then finally, his dying swan song in 2 in, uh, Timothy, he writes to Luke. Okay, now, uh, mark out uh, pages five, because that's already been covered, and then page six, uh, the book of Philippians. Christ is, remember there are four uh, outlines, Christ is life's purpose, Philippians 1, and let's read uh, these words here, his purpose in Philippians 1, 21, page 6. Everybody reading? For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then uh, the next uh, passage uh, I'll read is, he could rest in God's security. And I want you to read this, be, being confident. Okay. Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I have something I want to show you here. <clears throat> Years ago, uh, someone approached me <clears throat> from Accent uh, Publisher, and <clears throat> they said, I wonder if you could help us out. And I said, well, uh, I'll be glad to. Uh, you want me to write a book for you? He said, well, not really. But what we want you to do is convince Dr. Falwell uh, to give us his testimony. We have these little booklets, and I'll show you the picture here in a minute. My favorite verse, and they've asked uh, some of the, at that time, the, this was 25 years ago. They asked uh, D. James Kennedy and, and uh, Chuck Colson and some of these uh, great statesmen of the faith to write their favorite verse. So uh, I approached Jerry, and he said, I'm too busy. I said, I'll tell you what, if you'll give me some, uh, some background here, I will write it for you. Would you do that? I said, yes. And so this is uh, Jerry Falwell here. And uh, my favorite verse, which was Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And if ever, if ever God allowed 
a pastor, a man or woman, a Bible worker, uh, to fulfill his favorite verse. It was Jerry Falwell, Philippians 1, verse 6. Uh, he certainly performed it until the day of Jesus Christ, in this case, to the day he met Jesus Christ. I honestly believe this, that in his lifetime of, what, 75 years, Jerry Falwell was allowed by the grace of God to do more, arguably, for the kingdom than any other person in church history. I said, wait a minute now. Uh, what about uh, Martin Luther, the Lutheran church? Uh, what, about the, what about Charles and John Wesley, the Methodist church, and George Whitfield, the Presbyterians? And, and uh, for many years, there were hundreds and hundreds of churches, and they were all Bible-believing churches. They're not, unfortunately, some today. No, I'm saying uh, most of that happened in those men's life after they died. But during the time that he was on earth, I think God allowed Dr. Falwell and us to be a part of it. We, we can never, for, uh, for we praise God enough for what he's done for Jerry. He's done more for the cause of Christ than any other person in church history. Okay, and that was his favorite verse. All right, now on page 7 uh, at the... Uh, Number two here, Paul's thanksgiving for the saints. And let's read this beginning. I thank my God on page seven. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making request with joy, even as is meet for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart. And so much as both in my bonds and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers <clears throat> of my grace. <clears throat> the first part here, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And <clears throat> I read this back and forth over the years, and I'm convicted every time that it is a sin when we think of others not to pray for them at the same time. Uh, Paul said, every time I remember you, I pray for you. Uh, you may remember some of the things that people have done against you or said against you, but if they're a believer, when you think about them, you need to pray for them. And I think in 1 Samuel 12, verse 23, Samuel is giving his uh, final address to the nation Israel, and uh, here's what he says before, he, he short, before shortly his death. And then Saul becomes, and he doesn't want Saul to be a king, but the people said, we want a king. And so at any rate, uh, but he said, in spite of the fact that, that I have uh, warned you not to do it, but you're going to do it anyway, but this is what he says. Moreover, bottom line, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Oh, what a testimony he had. God forbid and Paul said, I, every time I think about you, I pray for you. All right, on page 7, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, near the end, there, Paul's explanation to the saints. Now, here's where we get in some dicey stuff. Uh, Philippians 1, 12, where it says, I would that you should understand reading. But I would that ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. You know, God works the wrath of men for his own glory. Okay, he's in jail. He can't win anybody to Christ. But he's in this, this uh, prison here. And uh, at the, uh, we read here, he said, So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. So these are the CIA and the FBI. Uh, these are the secret service. The, these are the cream of the crop of the Roman uh, guard and everything. And uh, they're listening to him and all of his prayers and uh, people that come to see him because he was, uh, he was uh, uh, allowed visitors. So you have the Praetorian Guard. He never could have reached that group had he not been in prison. And to everyone else, and then all the saints salute you chiefly, they that are in Caesar's household. So there is a theory, we don't know this to be a fact, that Caesar's wife or one of his wife had accepted Christ. But he had this audience in prison he could have never had uh, if he had a Billy Graham ministry preaching everywhere in prison. And at the bottom of page 7, Paul, was, uh, Paul says, uh, John Walbert says, Paul was guarded by imperial soldiers who were the cream of the Roman army. 
Uh, the apostle was probably chained to a Roman soldier every 24 hours a day with a new guard every six hours. And the next page here, uh, second paragraph uh, down, only God knows what went on in that rented room in which Paul was permitted to live. There, the guards heard the conversations of Paul with his intimate friends and were able to ask questions about the strange word what they heard from their prisoner. What do you mean justification? What do you mean sanctification? What do you mean imputation? In the lonely hours of the dark night, illuminated only by the moon, many a guard probably heard the testimony of Paul. This is an incredible, incredible story here. And the final one here. It reminds us that every circumstance of life is a platform on which the transforming grace of God can be manifested in the life of the Lord's own. Now, uh, the gospel has fallen out uh, for the good, but he's talking now about two kinds of individuals that are in Rome. One, uh, the courage of his friends, the carnality of his foes. Apparently, there's a both say, but the courage of his friends. And many of the brethren, many of my friends, in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear." And so, uh, ev evidently, his imprisonment sort of stimulated uh, the activities and intensified the activities of the good guys. That hey, look, our fearless leader is in jail. And so, we got to pass up more tracks today. We got to witness to more people, and uh, we got to pick up his fallen banner. That's great. Well, then there's one that didn't like him. Uh, the greatest person on earth, including Jesus, had his enemies, and Paul did too. And apparently these were, these were uh, saved people. But he goes on to say, uh, some indeed preach Christ out of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Yeah, we'll go out and see if we can win uh, more people uh, than Paul did, and we'll rub it in. You know, we don't need you. You know, we can do it our own. Uh, but others of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now, um, what about this? Uh, uh, just recently, uh, two days ago, I read the final account uh, and, uh, of uh, a pastor, a large church in Hammond, Indiana, First Baptist Church. Jack Kyle's pastor at that church. And there were some problems uh, with... Uh, Jack and whether there was some moral issues there, but he died, and his son became a, just a reprobate. Well, anyway, Jack Hiles' uh, son, son-in-law, who married his daughter, uh, took the church, been there for 11 years, 54 years old, huge church, and has influenced tens of thousands of pastors across America. And uh, we have one of our finest, I don't want to tell you who he was, but uh, one of our, is, one of our finest uh, godly teachers at the university as a graduate of his school, the Duck Isle School. And uh, they don't make him any better than this guy. Uh, but at any rate, uh, he was arrested uh, a month ago, the FBI get in on this story, uh, of having sex with a 16-year-old girl. And uh, he's confessed to that, and, uh, but it's a felony. That's why the FBI has been involved because he took her across two state lines in, uh, in ha Hammond is near Illinois, uh, state line there, and uh, in, in Wisconsin. So he's going to be sentenced um, in January. Uh, the minimum probably be 10 years in prison, and it could be life. How on earth could that happen? But, but not so much. A, what does God think about all that? Uh, he preached Christ out of envy. Now, as far as I know, as far as I know, his first name was Jack, like his father-in-law. Uh, Jack preached the book, The Blood and the Blessed Hope. If he'd meet you on the street and you'd ask him, what must I do to be saved? I think he'd go through the four spiritual laws. There's no doubt about that. But he didn't do it with a sincere heart. Now, what's Paul saying here? Well, he says, what then? What's my opinion at the bottom page? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. And so, on uh, top of that, I have this. Uh, the greatest problem in the world then is, uh, back then as it is today, is not uh, when the gospel is imperfectly preached, but when it is not preached at all. God takes more glory 
because Jack preached all those sermons. And uh, God blessed, if you could teach a parrot, John 3, 16, God would bless that message because you're going to always bless his word. So he's going to bless the message. But the name of the game, folks, is to live in such a way that he can bless the messenger as well as the message. So what does God think about all these things and pastors running away and all kinds of Well, it grieves his heart, but in spite of it, his son is being glorified. Okay, on page 9, Paul says, uh, number 1, according to my earnest expectation, it is my hope that nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now and also in Christ, shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life life or death. And then his desire was to part and be with the Savior. So I am in a strait between two, between a rock and a hard place. Having desire to depart, And be with Christ, which is better, but nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Now, he refers to death as to depart. And we have these notes. Paul speaks of death as a departure. This word depart was used by soldiers, especially when they took down their tent and moved on. They didn't go out of existence. They just moved from point A to point B. And so to depart simply means... uh, as Paul said, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so our dear sister, 95 years old, Mrs. Rannett, uh, went to be with the Lord this morning. And uh, she departed this uh, earthly veil. And according to 2 Corinthians 5, she has a, a body made in the heavens, not made with human hands awaiting her. All right, uh, that's uh, in the bottom of page 9. Christ is life's purpose. Christ is life's pattern. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not going to get through all of this, but I do want to, uh, on page 10, have you read with me. I won't have you stand like we would do in Dallas Seminary. But uh, the greatest, number, letter B in the middle of page 10, the greatest theological passage in all the Bible is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And uh, we're going to read, uh, there's two sections, Philippians 2, 5 to 8, and then we'll leave, read uh, 9 to 11. But 5 to 8, uh, where it says, let this mind be in you. I want everybody to read this now. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and be found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I want to zero in on five words, six words, but made himself of no reputation. Uh, In the Greek, that's kenu, kenosis. That means literally he emptied himself. There's a glass of water here. If I would take that cup, that glass, and pour it out, I would do a kenosis on it. I would pour out the water. Of course, air would rush in, but I would empty it. Now, this passage tells us, been greatly misunderstood, that when Christ left heaven, as the songwriter said, when he leaped over the ivory palace of heaven and came down to take upon himself the body of a man, he emptied himself. Uh, we have a negative and a positive here. Negative, he did not lay aside in any sense of the word his deity. He was, is, and ever shall be the total son of God. Kenneth Copeland and, and uh, Oral Roberts and uh, many of those on television uh, had uh, said that to Benny uh, Hinn, etc., that he emptied himself of his deity, but he didn't. So, but what did he empty himself of? Okay, positive. He did. He did, for a while, 33 years, hide his heavenly fame in an earthly frame. Even though he retained every single attribute of deity while on earth, he did nevertheless surrender to the Holy Spirit the independent exercise of those divine characteristics. Now, for example, was he omniscient on earth? Yes, but he didn't always use that omniscience. For example, in Mark chapter 13... Uh, he's 
preaching on the second coming and the end of the world. And the disciples said, when, when will this happen? And here's what he said in verse 32. He said, but of that day, when, when all things will be, um, will be manifest, he said, but of that day and of that hour, knoweth no man, nor the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but my Father. Now, wait a minute. Omniscience, that means he knows everything. Did he know that or not? Yes and no. It's almost as if you, uh, you knew the answer and it's in your coat pocket or your pocketbook and uh, you just determined uh, that, that uh, uh, you weren't going to look at it. You knew where it was and I'm going to completely depend upon the Holy Spirit because uh, I want to take upon myself not only the body of a man but the limitations also and he was subjected in, in all temptations we are yet without sin. And uh, so uh, you get the idea that he would not have said a word, uh, bent down and picked up a rock, uh, and uh, thought a thought, used any kind of action on earth without the uh, express opinion, uh, express leadership of the Holy Spirit. He depended completely upon the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was not always omnipresent. For example, that means there at the same time. In John 11, verse 15, Jesus told the disciples, Lazarus is dead. He, first of all, he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps. He said, oh, if he sleeps, he's probably got the flu. I, said, I don't want to go back to Bethany. That's too close to Jerusalem. They tried to kill you last time. And, no, no. He said, I say for your sake plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad I was not there. Well, he was and he wasn't. Um, he did not all, he, he never used, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, he never used in an independent way his deity, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his divine attributes. And uh, to say anything less is blasphemy. So that's the, he emptied himself, okay, and uh, he left heaven's glory. He made himself of no reputation. He was made in the likeness of human beings. He took upon, next page 11, he took upon himself the form of a servant. He humbled himself, that is, he submitted to authority. He became obedient unto death. He died on a cursed cross. He did not just die, but suffered the worst kind of death, both physically and judicially. Now, to die on the cross was the worst kind of death. Think of it this way. Uh, think of uh, a Benedict Arnold in prison for traitor, the most, uh, the most horrible uh, traitor that we've ever had, Benedict Arnold in prison dying of AIDS. Now that would be a pretty cursed death. That gives us a glimpse of the death that Jesus Christ, not like Socrates who was drinking the hemlock and everything and surrounded by his uh, loved ones, etc. He died not only a death, but the worst of all possible deaths, judiciously, and uh, as well as physically. All right, now, uh, that is what he gave up. Now, what did he gain? Well, wherefore, number two, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, things under the earth, that, that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Now, look at what he gave up, uh, what he retained, page 11. Uh, you have uh, the creatures of this. He, will be, he has been given a name exalted by the Father himself. He will be universally acknowledged as Lord of all. The method of this acknowledgement, by the bowing of the knee and the confession of the tongue, the creatures of this acknowledgement, those in heaven, that's the angels, the world of angels, those on earth, the world of saints and sinners, those under the earth, the world of demons. Um, to confess him in this life as Lord means salvation, but to wait until the next life will result in damnation. Thus, the supreme question is not when a human being, human being will do this, all of us will, but rather where. And... Um, one final thing on page 12, and we'll finish this next week. Um, Paul says at the top of page, because of this, we are to work out our own salvation. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now so much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
our Mormon uh, friends I've been reading, I've read 1,200 pages on Mormonism recently, and they said that that's one verse that proves that uh, you can't know that you're saved. You have to uh, be baptized and receive uh, baptism from uh, one that's got the Melchizedek priesthood and confess your sin and uh, then work out. You know, by grace are you saved through faith as long as you do the best you can. That's, they've added that word. Joseph Smith added those two. Because it says work out your own salvation. But here, uh, we note he did not say work for your own salvation. The idea here is to complete something. The Greeks use this phrase in bringing a math problem to its logical conclusion and also to work a gold mine in a field. Now, this final statement is very important. It is thus not by imitation, but by incarnation. The Christian life, I keep reminding myself of this, is not to be a series of ups and downs, but rather ins and outs. God works in, we are to work out. Uh, Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask your blessing upon your precious word as it goes out. And dear Lord, if we're speaking to those who have never accepted Christ as Savior, may they do what the Apostle Paul did so many years ago on the road to Damascus, and what many of us have done many years ago also, perhaps in a church service, beside a television set, as we read a track, opened our hearts, and allow Jesus to come in and save us from our sins. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. We're going to stand just a minute and sing, and if you have uh, the invitation is always open. If you have any need, uh, any, from time to time people come, and I'm honored. Uh, I'll shake hands with my left hand, not my right hand tonight, but uh, we'll be happy to help you in any way we can.